start off, you know, you and I have chatted about this exhibition at Korean um, a lot, and I want to start out by uh, saying that, you know, these works are recent works, and they come from a particular period in Yu Min's career. Um, so, if you can tell us a bit of this particular period that all these works come from. Yeah, and I, I think. Um, when we had that conversation, I think one of the things that I mentioned to Eileen was like, gosh, I don't know if I'll, I'll continue making these after works because it, it was so particular to the time period that I was kind of um, part of. I mean, we were all part of, and that is the, uh, the pandemic that um, happened in 2020. And that's actually when I moved into Studio Sang in February 2020 when I got the residency here. So immediately after I moved in um, and moved all my stuff to my new studio, I sort of had to like pack things again and pick it back home because everything was shut down. And then a few months later, I returned back to the studio saying to work. Um, and we were, I was, I, I teach at, um, at KU as most of you know, I was teaching online and kind of trying to do my studio work at the same time. And my husband also teaches, so we were trying to both teach on Zoom in our little house. So I would often just come to my studio and work in the studio and do the teaching and do everything in my studio. So I sort of like clocked in and clocked out every day um, from Lawrence. And I didn't have access to my usual facilities at KU because I wasn't going on campus. So I was, I didn't have access to the press or I had started making ceramic works, so I kind of stopped making ceramic works. So I was kind of in my studio, um, feeling a bit lost, as not sure what to do and feeling overwhelmed with all of the things that's going on around the world. Um, so uh, I think one of the things that I tend to do is, in my studio practice, it's just kind of like something. And that's kind of what I started doing. And I happened to have um, Tyvek roll a roll of Tyvek in my studio. And I always have a big thing of sumi in my studio because sumi is something that I often use in my drawing works. And I was just playing, and it, you, you're seeing kind of the more the, the later version, or I guess more figured out version of this process. But you know, there were a lot of just like, bad things that I just kind of did. And I think there was a moment, I always feel like, um, I, I think one of the things that I try to do is I trust that something's going to happen in my studio. And that's what I was hoping. And my work often involved some kind of subject matter or something that I noticed that I feel like that feels a little bit interesting to me in, in that they are they involve some kind of a routine but then um it 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 it, it has some kind of like an interesting contradiction with them themselves so that's why i always gravitate towards disposable things and the main disposable thing during the pandemic time were, were these boxes delivery boxes that just constantly came into my space. And with all of those together, I think what happened was that I started to use delivery boxes as templates and subject matters, so as materials and templates and subject matters, and started to make these um, high-back pieces. Um, so in that sense, it's something that is completely different in some ways from my regular studio practice as a printmaker. Um, but at the same time, I think, I don't know, I do think there's some, some connection still to, to my work. In what way? I guess they, they always, um, they're still about that contradicting sense of like feeling I have about time that they or the nature of the material that you know I mean always and it's also about the routine and the daily and the mundane things. So I was using these boxes that that I was kind of processing through every day in my my house.
house. And it sort of became this ritual of how I bring those into my space. And we have these like little quarantine zones. Um, and I douse them with like my homemade alcohol spray. That's actually when you see all these type of pieces, the, the texture you see are um, after I paint the Thai bed sheet with sumi ink. Before sumi ink dries, I will spray that with the, actually the same disinfectant spray that I use on the boxes to these surfaces. And it makes it visible that kind of disinfecting action that I would do. So I was kind of bringing in that, the actual literal thing that I did to, to these boxes to my work. Um, so in that sense, you know, just kind of using the these disposable um, material as my subject matter and material, but also at the same time, kind of thinking about the nature of time, passage of time, and the ritual, and just just that nature, that that interesting and fascinating nature of these disposable objects that I always think about that they. They're designed to be used really briefly just for the purpose of protecting that item that's inside. Um, and then once that item is what you actually want, then it loses its usefulness. Um, so those are some of the things that I constantly think about in, in my work. So I think that's something that continues with my work, although um, if you're familiar with my older work, it looks very different, I think, from my older works. Yeah, I'm, what I would say that's remarkable about this exhibition is that it's, it's a time capsule of a time period that was like monumental for all of us. I, would, I, could, I think I can dare say that, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic. And all these works, you know, reflect that time and how we reacted to it so literally like <coughs> um, disposable and discarded negatives which is behind both of you you know that's like you, you order things online you get these boxes and then you go through your ritual of disinfection i think all of us do that and you see that there right the the the, the service is done that is that way because you need um, and then, you know, the piece you see here, um, what's it, I think not, this, this is keeping, <coughs> you know, it's, it's, it's the inside packaging, you know, and again, it's, it all reflects like how all of a sudden we're ordering stuff online so much more, and we have all of these packaging, and so to me it's remarkable because it, it's like a very coherent um, showing of works that are that's common that are commenting on this particular period in our lives. So I find that fascinating, um, and I think that excuse me. Of course, now I'm having a coughing fit, and I can't, can't stop. So forgive me, but you know, you can have, and I had talked about this that you know, as a printmaker. You always have something that's um, what you need calls a matrix, which is the starting point, a black or, or a flip, and then you print from it, right? So the, what, you're, what you produce is kind of a <laughs> translation of that original. And in that sense, if you look at all these things here in this exhibition, even though they look very different in form from the prints that you know you're familiar that really does, actually it's the same concept. You know, where it's a matrix boxes for packaging packaging material that she then translates or into from into a different medium. And so it's it's translation from the original into something else. And it makes you think differently about them. You know, and that's what I love about Yumi's work, that you know, she takes things that you don't pay attention to and then when she translates it into a different medium, thank you. <laughs> when she translates it into a different medium, then all of a sudden you see it all in a different light. 
So yeah. that, that, that's something that I, I, I hope you can you know, think about when you're going around with the show and looking yeah. at works. And I, I feel like that's something that's really inherent in the way I think about things as um, someone who is from another um, culture and is from another language or now mm -hmm. live in the US. Um, the act of translation is something that I constantly, like it's just, just part of um, part of who I am. Um, trying to understand something through translation is, I felt, I realized it's something that is inherently who I am as somebody who kind of goes between two different countries, two different languages, and two different cultures. But I also realized um, perhaps that's why I was so, um, interested in printmaking as a medium because to me printmaking is, a, is about translation. You know, it, it often, there's this idea of translation of translating a painting or a drawing into a printed imagery, but also how um, to me a uh, matrix is the object but then it's translated as an impression. So there's that kind of relationship between uh, the matrix and the impression and without even me noticing it, I realized, even when I started making ceramic pieces, I realized I'm not really that interested in like sculpting ceramics or throwing ceramics. I'm more interested in making molds and slip casting because to me that makes sense as a printmaker. It's, and for, for all of this body of work in, in this um, exhibition, I think that is something that um, Goes, it, 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 it threads through everything. It is about the relationship between the actual object that I'm actually looking at or thinking about or contemplating. And I literally use that and then pick a, a impression or a form um, or casting from it and in my own way translate that thing and perhaps like creating my own language with those. Um, that through that process. Yeah, and so let's get into some specifics. Um, can, you, can you tell us more about um, these sculptural works over here? You know, celadon <coughs> ceramics of what looks like styrofoam takeout containers, and on these tables or, or pedestals. Can you um, talk, talk about them? Yeah. Um, so when I started making these ceramics, um, I don't know, maybe this might become a long story, but um, we're all here, so. <laughs> you have a captive audience. <laughs> um, I started making ceramic really because of, um, just for practical reasons. I actually, um, and when I make prints, I, and I, I think in my studio I just often like just kind of I think that's the luxury of you know, being in the studio, just being able to be in this private space and allow yourself to just kind of play and just kind of see what happens without the, just letting one thing lead to another thing. And that's how I tend to work. Um, and I really enjoy that. And I became really interested in the idea of disposable objects. And some of you might be familiar with my earlier work, Arranged Flower Series, where I have images of cut flower arrangements in um, disposable containers. Um, and those speak about that kind of idea of contradicting the nature of sense of time that feels both permanent and fleeting. So when I started doing that body of work, I just started to collect a lot of um, disposable objects basically, kind of as a way to reference some of my drawings and prints. And when I started collecting them, I would collect like um, fast food cups and plastic bags and containers and, and things like that. And they became really interesting to me as like the actual objects. So I started to engage them kind of in a three-dimensional way. So I just got a fun, and actually this is how, um, the wood paper box um, collective is something that I kind of started uh, with my friends um, as a way to continue our um, conversation and engagement. It wasn't really something that we started to 
become a collective. It was just a way to like um, have a dialogue um, through making. So we would make something and send it to each other and then make another thing and send it to one another. And we're all print makers. We, we engage in print making so we can make multiples. So that's how we started. And when I and it was kind of a, a really safe space for me to just kind of try random things that I felt like I wanted to try, but at the moment it didn't seem like it related to anything in my work. I just had a hunch that if this was important that I needed to try, but I, I wasn't sure what it is. So in our first box, one of the things that I made is I started collecting all of these trash, literally is I made a little miniature plastic bag out of donkey paper. And I was like, oh, this is really interesting. Uh, but I made a little miniature one because I had to nail it to them. So I just made a little miniature version of it. And then after I made a couple of them, and then I was curious, what if I made it in an actual size? So I made an actual size one. And that was interesting, but then I didn't know what to do with them because they're made out of donkey paper, which is really this really thin Japanese paper. I wanted it to exist in space. I didn't want it to be flat at all, at all. but it's so thin and light that you can't you can't just put it on a pedestal or something. So if somebody just walks past it, it will just like go away. So essentially, I just needed something heavy to hold it down, and that's when I thought well, maybe I can make a take up container out of ceramics and put it on top of it. So that's, I mean, I'm just kind of putting it in the, the most simplest way. I mean, there's a lot more other things that's going on. But on the other hand, it's kind of true. It's pretty straightforward how I kind of move from one to the next and kind of think about things while I'm making. Um, so that's kind of I, the reason I started ceramics. And initially, I think I was more interested in trying to faithfully recreate it so it looks like the real thing. So I would make white porcelain styrofoam containers or cast glass belly containers, trying to find materials that translate and have this moment of like, wait, it kind of looks like it, but it doesn't look like it. So that was really kind of fun for a while. And then as I got in, engaged in this process of making works with clay, I started to see a lot more possibility with clay because of this kind of nature of the malleability of the clay, but it also, it also allowed me to kind of think about time in a different way because ceramic um, has this completely different sense of time compared to the materials that I have been using, or the subject matter that I was kind of interested in, which is plastic um, or disposable paper materials. So, you know, right now I'm kind of continuing to think about it as I'm making it. That's how I think. I, I make it while I'm thinking. So that's why I sort of move, moved away slowly from um, faithfully recreating it to kind of starting to add another layer of some kind of sense of time. So um, that's why I started to glaze them with Solidon, because Solidon has this deep history um, and it's something that's from my own um, background. So I wanted to kind of explore that as material and also um, reference to my identity, but at the same time, completely different sense of history and time, that kind of like time that it feels a little really different from um, the sense of time that disposable containers and plastics hold. Um, so this was a long story to get to that. So this is kind of my way of exploring that right now. So I started to kind of stack them and really be stacking just started because I was doing a body of work, um, kind of referencing, like thinking about the kitchen table as a site for just this temporary still life. And this is something that often happens on my kitchen table, just stacks of pink outs um, that just get put out and just like, and I just love how these kind of become these like both spontaneous but feeling very intentional 
kind of arrangement. Um, so I started to just kind of like build these like patterns um, as a way to kind of explore both that idea of just the spontaneous kitchen table arrangement, but also bringing some kind of sense of like weight and history. And for this particular shot, I wanted to add an additional layer to this by making these um, custom making these tables. Um, and some of you might know about Connor Mitchell, Mitchell at Kitty Group, and he's the one who fabricated all of these for me. Um, he, um, so I have these are referencing Soban, which is traditional Korean dining tables. So it, it really looks like it's at the scale of like, uh, what do you call it? A TV table, TV dinner tray table. It's very temporary, it gets put away, it's not like permanently there. And I think, I think that's another reason why I'm interested in these that are kind of like in, in like Korean or I think East Asian interior space in general, nothing is permanently there. You know, you're, you lay out the bed to sleep, but it gets folded up. You bring out the table to eat, but then you take the table away. So I wanted to kind of put a context to this and create this kind of sense of that space by giving a little bit of a suggestion of, of that, that, that space. So that's why I um, have these um, designed and made and kind of paired up with these um, ceramics together. So these tables, people are <coughs> so bun, but then they're not, they don't look exactly like this one. No, no, yeah, they're actually, they're sort of, I guess there's an element of practicalness in that it, it sort of functions like a pedestal. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of um, influenced by it, but they, the traditional Soban will have four legs, not a, like a pedestal plinth-like um, structure. Yeah, so what I find really exciting about um, these works, you know, your, your Celadon sculptures of originally uh, styrofoam containers is that you know, Celadon, you know, you have traditional um, Korean Celadon you know, vessels and sculptures that have lasted hundreds of years. That's what that material does, is to make something last for a very long time and durable. And, you know, to, to use a subject matter in these bosses that we think is one-time use, right? But, you know, you casting them in Celadon, then we, we think about um, the, the longevity of time, of some, how something may last. And I don't know about, I, I, I realized from thinking that way that, wait, but yes, these objects are disposable, but we know, right, that if a styrofoam box gets thrown in the landfill, it's there forever, it doesn't break down. And so, I, I, you know, that's, that's something that you're able to catch on, and, you know, that's, that's why you know, we need artists, right? Because they see things differently and they make us think differently about, you know, our lives, you know, and, and, and really does that with ease. Um, let's move on to um, this arrangement in front of us, which, you know, looks like similar, but they are different. Can you tell us how they're different? Yeah, so I, meant, I, I briefly mentioned this a little bit, I think, um, that, um, so these kind of started, so I, I made these, this body of art earlier, um, or, or the idea of that was earlier, and then after I made the Taipei pieces, um, referencing delivery boxes, with delivery boxes came a lot of plastic containers. And I started to kind of think about containers um, especially uh, vacuum-formed plastic containers, because they have such interesting shapes and forms because of the need, of the, the functional need of these, because they're shaped to protect the thing that's inside while they're in transition, transitional period. And um, whenever there's this idea of like transition or something fleeting or not permanent. I think that's when I like, that's what I'm interested in. Um, so 
they, they are so permanent as material in one sense, but then so fleeting because their only uh, purpose is to protect that thing inside during transition. And what, immediately after that thing is taken out, it loses its usefulness completely. There's no need, and, and all, most of these are food containers, but some of them are like, um, I do have some like COVID tests containers and electronic containers, um, but majority are food containers. And they're kind of designed with the ridges and things for its practical need to protect it from shock or, you know, whatever it is, or separate items within it. Um, but essentially protect them. So I was kind of thinking about, which, as I was doing these boxes, I wanted to kind of, and, and the you know world opened up a little bit, so I was able to go back into the ceramic studio and started to kind of think about, along with the boxes, because I, I feel like the Taipei pieces and the, these kind of go together. Um, so I started to kind of think about that that negative space where the the thing that is what we desire is in it, um, and that form that um, that was designed to protect that thing from for that brief time period. So these are essentially um, casting of the inside of all of these containers. Um, Conceptually, it's really simple. Like it is just the casting of the inside of the containers, but to actually make the, these takes a lot more layers because first I have to get a plaster cast of the inside of the containers, which I then use to make a mold of it, and then that mold is used for the slip cast. So it takes multiple layers. Um, but again, that's something that I always find um, <coughs> fascinating. That kind of layers and layers of like translation through contact is as a process and maybe maybe not important you know at the end but as an artist that's kind of the, the way that i work yeah so these pieces you know in a way like what you've done is basically you didn't form to avoid yeah yeah right, right? because like you got, that's that's the actual object and this is the void inside of the object yes that you can yeah. be visible Yes. And uh, again, I find that fascinating. I think I think it's part of maybe your the influence of uh, East Asian art, you know, where the void as as a as a compositional aspect is quite important. You know, both Chinese art, Korean art, and Japanese yeah. art. You know, and I know like you talked about this when you were in grad school, in undergrad. Um, would be the mustard seed gar garden and your painting. Yeah, in grad school, yeah. Yeah, oh, in grad school. So, you know, even, I, I think like there's that influence there because, you know, that manual painting shows you all the things that, you know, how to paint this, how to paint that. And in, in those compositions, within those pages, the void is a major aspect in, in the composition. Yeah, I think it is, yeah. I mean, it's unconscious, you yeah. know, like, that, that's why I find fascinating that, you know, you just, you saw the void and you created a work that's about the void, yeah. you know, and that brings us to, you know, the works that are behind you guys, you know, um, this is disposable and discarded. Uh, delivered and discarded. Delivered and discarded, negatives, and then behind us is delivered and discarded, positives. Um, and maybe can you just tell everyone like how you created these forms briefly? Yeah, yeah. So I think I, I did mention it a little bit earlier about this process, but these are um, Taiwan sheets. I would paint them with sumi ink, and there are just different sumi inks, and different sumi inks would have different um, slight like um, tones to them. Some are slightly brownish, some might like be bluish. Um, so that's why you see a little bit of variation and. Some of them are more diluted. Um, and then before the sumi ink dries, I would spray it with alcohol sanitizer. And then, so I would have stacks and stacks of these sheets that I go in with um, flattened out cardboard boxes and literally just trace the edges and then cut, cut it out. And then um, the cutouts are scored and 
folded to imitate how the boxes were folded. Um, so, so I get, I have the negatives and the positives, and they're kind of like, I think I started with these, because I was kind of like thinking about my recycling process. You know, I, I flatten them out and I stack them and then take them out. Um, so I was just kind of stacking them. Um, and then I saw those and I was like, oh, that's interesting. Um, so then I started to stack, stack those as well. And I didn't even think about this, but last night somebody said that you really don't waste any materials, don't you? So I was like literally using both of these positives and negatives, but you know, it wasn't intentional, but yeah. Yeah, and these pieces, again, you know, uh, they look like otherworldly, you know, like, like stacking them like this, they become something else, right? And then um, I, 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 the more I look at these pieces in the back of negatives, the more I'm fascinated by them, because again, you're you're showing through the void, you know, mm -hmm. and, and what the void can mean. And, you know, it's fun to think about it, and all of us will probably think about it differently. But um, to me, there's like an element of magic. And yet, you know, the, the foundation of that concept is something that is a part of mundane contemporary life. You know, you get your package, you break down the boxes because you have to do that in order to recycle, and then you stack them. And so that, that's, uh, that's something that I think, you know, it, for, uh, is a theme in this work, you know, all across the mm -hmm. series, is that idea of um, taking something that is mundane, everyday action, or, you know, um, thing in, in contemporary life, and then trans transforming it into something that becomes thoughtful. Um, uh, can we just talk briefly about those prints on the wall? They're mono prints. Um, uh, can you tell us how you how they came to be, and also why you arranged them in this way? Yeah. Um, so those are pressure prints. Um, I don't know how many print makers are here. Um, I see one for sure. But, um, um, pressure printing is. And these are all monotypes, so there, there, there's a single word impression. Pressure printing is a process, or at least the way I do it. There's a couple of different ways of doing pressure printing. Um, I basically ink up a sheet of plexi with ink, really transparent ink. Um, and then I put a piece of paper on top of it. And then I put boxes behind the paper. And then I run the whole thing through the press. Then the physical thickness of the boxes will push the back of the paper more to pick up more ink from the other side. So literally the physicality of the paper, the boxes, so the boxes are not inked up at all. So the boxes act as more pressure. And for some reason that, that makes sense to me more. And um, there's this kind of physicality of the presence of the box applying more pressure and picking up more ink. Um, so the darker ones are printed that way, and then once you pull that print, you have what's called a ghost left over, um, the trace of that you know, leftover ink on the plexi. So then I put another sheet of paper on top and put a couple more boxes behind it and run it through the press. So it's both doing the pressure printing and monotype printing of the ghost. So I hope that makes sense. So that's the basically the process. And the reason why I kind of started doing that was, um, you know, I mean, truthfully, as a printmaker, I want to kind of like, that, that's like natural to me. Um, so as I was working with these uh, private pieces, I wanted to kind of explore other ways to use these boxes and kind of think about these boxes as, as literal matrices to use. Um, and kind of see what, what other possibilities of kind of handling these boxes and using these as, as materials and subject matter and, and matrices. So I did a bunch of these prints and I was kind of thinking about how to kind of organize this. And actually, Eileen and I were having a Zoom conversation and I was thinking, I was kind of talking about how I really wanted the gallery installation to 
subtly evoke a sense of like interior space without being literally like making you know putting furniture. I mean there's some furniture like objects and that's why it's here. I wanted to kind of evoke this kind of like interior space of a, how how in in Korea you exist in the interior space kind of down low close to the ground. So I and I was also really interested in exploring um, Chekori, the idea of Chekori, which is um, Korean traditional painting of books and things. It's literally translated as books and things. And it's basically a shelfie. So it's, there's shelves and books and flower arrangements and objects kind of arranged on the, um, the shelf. So I was interested in that format, and often those are um, um, on long folded folding screens. So I wanted to kind of, I, I think, and I was having a conversation with Eileen about that. And initially, I just had two rows in more of a traditional kind of way how you would present an image. And Eileen was like, "Well, these are like check out. You should just have it go all the way down to the floor and make it like evoke that kind of." screen-like um, structure. So that's, that's which I was like, oh my god. <laughs> okay. It's arrangement of boxes and things instead of yeah, boxes and things. things. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I don't know, I think, I mean, I'm, it's, yeah, a lot of these are kind of thinking about space in different ways and kind of experimenting, I think, yeah. Well, I think we should open up the forum for questions and yeah. conversation with our audience. Um, so, anybody have questions or comments? We'd love to hear them. Yes, Madam Yes, Mallory. Uh, I'm wondering, Yumi, if you could talk a little bit about the piece behind Brad, because you guys didn't mention that one yet, and it's a little different than your other pieces, yeah. and I think it's so interesting. Yeah, and there. Yeah, that's that's a different piece, but I just wanted to have it in, in the show, so I just added it. Um, and that's really like, um, as I got into ceramics, and I, I didn't do any, you know, I, I did my undergrad in Korea where we didn't, in, in America, in art school, you try everything. But in Korea, at least when I was a student, you pick a major, and that's all you do. So I only I only did print making. I didn't do anything else. So when I I, I didn't do any ceramics. I think in grad school, yeah, in grad school I was curious. So I took a ceramic class, which my um, grad advisors weren't happy about. <laughs> <laughs> You're not taking grad school seriously. Taking ceramic classes. <laughs> I was like, I just feel like I need to do this. So, um, so I took a ceramic class then, but I never really did anything after that. So I, I'm just like, now, you know, as I told you, like how I started doing ceramics, I just needed to like take workshops and learn. That's how I've been learning. I would, whenever I teach a workshop somewhere, like in an Anders Print or Finland or wherever, I see if there's a ceramic workshop before or after the workshop that I'm teaching. So I would take a workshop and you know, the ceramics community in Lawrence has been just amazing and just like helping me, teaching me, you know, how to do ceramics. And so that work is something that I just tried out when I was making wood firing workshop at Lawrence Art Center. So I just threw in a couple of pieces of my work that was already um, this fire and um, wanted to see how it would turn out in wood firing Kiln, which was incredible. So um, I just find that so interesting. It, it has this really different kind of sense of time and um, emotional quality to it because of its the nature of like ash just landing in and becoming the blaze. And I think that's that's one of the reasons that I'm also interested in sumi because sumi ink is essentially just ash that you collect and if you, you, you mix it with um, gelatin and that becomes to me a stick. And when there's, and same with like, like when a color, color is a material, I think that's 
that's really interesting to me. So I don't, I guess I don't have, you know, answer to that particular piece, but I said that I, I do want to explore it a little bit more. And that's, that's something that I think I want to try if I, if I get another chance to yeah. be part of the refinery. And they do that every semester at in, in, in KU. I'll probably definitely be doing some more. Well, I think you should. I think it's very cool. Oh, <laughs> sorry, you can hear me here. Um, so you need to be here also. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was curious about that. No. Uh, any other comments, David? You mean, it strikes me that the uh, Taiga pieces, the Taiga the wall, how about, how about a sense of mystery? If, if somebody doesn't know that you're, that the form of the Greek would be these flattened out boxes, I don't think they would necessarily discern that. Whereas these uh, cast ceramic pieces are very little. I mean, they look, even though they're installed on the study, plastic or styrofoam, they look literally like, and they have the same dimensions as the things that they are cast on. So have you thought about that kind of, that kind of, dichotomy between the kind of mysterious sort of unrecognizable translations versus the much more sort of literal literal translation of the author. Yeah, that's a good question. I guess I haven't thought about it that much, but I think in in some ways I think it's that's kind of exploring that, what you talk about. There are things that I'm really interested in. I am interested in when, like even when I was doing like literal uh, sort of like imitation of things, the thing that I found really, really interesting is that kind of uncertainty about material because my paper plastic bags look really like plastic bags. And one of the things that I found really fascinating whenever I show that is um, people are kind of can't figure this out, so they know they can't touch it to like uh, see what they are for themselves. So I saw several times people blowing on it to like figure it out, <laughs> which I think is really interesting. And um, in that sense, that kind of mystery of uncertainty and even with the Tyvek pieces, often people commented that they thought it was made out of metal, which I think is really interesting. Um, so in some ways, I think I am kind of trying to explore that a little bit, that mystery of material, the mystery of like materiality and how um, perhaps like that may be related to my interest in, in Translation of those materials. Yeah. And, and along with that, you make the distinction about I mean, these are things that we hold all the time and that were so our muscle memory is embedded within them. I mean, it gets more abstracted with these pieces mm -hmm. and then we get to dive. That's, that's why I love bringing them all together is relationally feeling. Yeah, and that's another thing that I'm kind of interested in too. And I thank you for saying, um, mentioning that because um, there's this kind of sense of familiarity and unfamiliarity. Because I, even though they, I do think they're very recognizable, but they're very unfamiliar in some ways. And I think a lot of the times we know these objects with our hands, but not necessarily with our eyes, because we don't care to look at it so closely, but I'm kind of like making everybody look at the form a little bit more closely by translating it into different materials. So familiarity and unfamiliarity is another kind of contradiction and kind of in-between space. It's always that in-between space that I'm kind of interested in. Which are the stories you make you think about even just a full page owl on 
cluster of like ice cream you know, mm -hmm. you know, and then it makes you think about the bread food you know, the column and and like the scale of like, like the furniture and so this, but that they are the temple mm -hmm. and the celebration of the mundane. Yeah, in my subtle way, I was kind of trying to create a little like passage. Like a journey, like these parents kind of marking along, marking along the way. So that's that's kind of what I was trying to do with these this arrangements. Even in my orange flower 
series at the first glance, I think people often just think it's like, oh, it's so pretty and you know, it's so fun for these containers, but you know, it's really a protest that I'm kind of, you know, in this like inevitable mess of our, you know, yeah, and where we all went up. Yeah, uh, thanks to everyone for your comments. You, you know, it, it is about mourning in a way, you know, because all the things that you need features here um, are, they're all temporary in a temporary state. They're gone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.